Hello, hello, welcome back to Harry Up Bit. Okay, so today we will continue with a reaction and commentary of God Bless Bitcoin. So this is part three of my reaction. So the last topic was about um, comparing Bitcoin with gold. I think we will be talking about uh, blockchain today. Okay, so uh, have a look. My cup is 21M Bitcoin. <laughs> and my t shirt is also 21M, 21 million. I will expound that one a bit later, okay? Um, all right, let's continue we will be talking about the bitcoin network now so to get this straight bitcoin is a digital asset that moves through the internet without a third party like a bank or credit card company approving the transaction all right let's go a little deeper you've probably heard of the word blockchain so what is a blockchain Blockchain just refers to a ledger. So the Bitcoin blockchain is a digital ledger of transactions where all the computers on the network have to agree to add a block to that ledger. So it's a chain, essentially, of blocks that each contain a list of transactions on the Bitcoin network. And the whole community, essentially the whole network, verifies that those transactions are accurate. The idea of a Okay, so uh, those are very important uh, concepts. So the, it's the entire network, all the computers of the network, the whole community, uh, the whole network has, have or has, have to verify that transaction. So the verification process has to be done by the entire community all the computers okay that's why it takes about 10 minutes for um, for the blocks to be filled like uh, one ledge uh, a block is one one group of transactions so for one block to be filled it's a, it takes about 10 to 20 minutes okay and all the computers in the world have to uh, approve and agree that and verify the transaction okay so that's why it's very difficult to hack the Bitcoin network because the hacker has to do it I mean enter all the computers of the world and then do it at the same time so that is that is impossible okay um, yeah so that's why the network is very secure okay let's continue digital ledger will make more sense if we get a clearer picture of how ledgers work the ledger is nothing new it can be traced back to the 11th century and was popularized in florence italy during the renaissance in the 14th and 15th centuries it's simply the way we've been keeping track of who owns what for about a thousand years now for example, when you deposit money in your bank account, you have a credit on the right side of the ledger. The bank has a debit on the left side of the ledger because they owe you that deposit when you want to withdraw it. Easy enough. It gets a bit more complicated when you want to buy something with the money in your bank account. Now the bank and the store have to reconcile your bank account with the store's bank account to move the money because they each have their own ledgers. And your ledger has to reconcile with their ledger, which can take a few days or up to 30 days as with credit cards. Now multiply this times billions of people moving their money to buy things every day. And remember, the banks on both sides take a fee. All these transaction fees add up to trillions of dollars each year. That comes out of your pocket and the store's pockets. The beauty of Bitcoin okay. is... So it just... Uh talks out about the ledger system so you know the, it's been done for centuries okay so the important th thing here is uh, each bank keeps its own ledger so imagine there are so many banks all over the world so there are so many ledgers basically all over the globe to be reconciled 
to be verified and remember what Kathy Wood was saying that it takes about nine steps to verify one transaction especially credit cards sometimes it could take days sometimes it could take 30 days and uh, it gets more complicated when you transfer funds overseas because you have to involve the the SWIFT system this is what the banks are using now as a service so it's like a society for worldwide interbank financial tele telecommunication swift okay so it's kind of like a messaging uh, network that the bank uses for uh, international transactions to be initiated and verified okay so that's what they do at the moment so it's really quite slow okay and plus there are fees along the way so i think for international transactions you they charge you around 25 dollars okay so it depends where you are of course but there are so many charges along the way the chinese merchants usually don't like to use visa you know these credit cards because they charge they charge them they charge us okay so it's like so many charges no along the way so they charge the client the user they charge the merchant as well for uh, one tran one transaction okay um uh yeah and uh lucky we have online banking nowadays but um imagine during the old days when you cannot go to the bank after hours you have to do it during business hours and you have to do it during the work days no the banks are not open the weekends or during holidays at least nowadays we have online banking which is good but it's still not comparable to the bitcoin network okay uh let's continue it will introduce now bitcoin that it's one universal ledger that's updated and distributed around the world every 10 minutes best of all it requires no middleman like a bank which gives you complete control of your money okay that's just a quick description of the bitcoin network so it's a universal network okay so there's only one universal recording of all those transactions unlike in the banking system when each bank has to reconcile with another bank and each branch to another branch and, and another branch to another oh my god it's in the bitcoin network it's a universal ledger it is updated and distributed around the world every 10 minutes because it takes about 10 minutes to fill that block of transaction okay um, so there is no middlemen there are no banks we can transact with one another peer-to-peer -peer as long as we use the Bitcoin network okay and we have complete control of our money unlike the banking system when they actually have control over your money so it happened to me actually when i saw, when i had my aha moment when i discovered uh, bitcoin about four years ago i was uh, my bank account was frozen by my bank they were questioning me why i am transferring a lot of money to this particular crypto exchange so they were worried that i've been scam or something like that so i had to call them and explain that no it's i know what i'm doing i'm buying bitcoin i know what bitcoin is i have studied it and i am i haven't been scammed by anyone it's me i know what i'm doing okay so that's a problem they can just freeze your account so 
you that's your asset it's our asset it's my money i should have complete control over my money okay so but at the moment we're using the banking system well oh well okay but uh yeah we should uh that's why the banks are afraid of bitcoin <laughs> they will be uh, obsolete soon just like the um, uh, the mail the postal system so it becomes obsolete when the uh, the email um, was discovered so many things have become obsolete we have the um, uh, fax system so uh it's becoming obsolete we have the remember the telephone the telephone line so it's it's becoming obsolete because we can now call each other using the internet so yeah some things will become obsolete it it takes uh, a while for um, you know physical money and to become obsolete because money is complicated there's a lot of uh, things involved um, and there will be a lot of opposition to the to the system because uh, they will no longer have the quote-unquote privileges okay they will lose their privileges if they start using the Bitcoin network network okay so let's continue so now that digital ledgers make sense you might be wondering how you keep your bitcoin safe on the blockchain the way that i would describe um, storing your bitcoin um, on a blockchain is like a locker system so at your high school you had a locker and your locker had both a public address so my locker was c19 and i can give that address to everybody hey go put this envelope in my locker c19 that's my public address but only i have the key the private key to open that locker and move stuff from one to another so securing my bitcoin or cryptocurrency would be the same thing where you have this blockchain which is like this digital locker system and there's a public address and everybody can know that address and anybody can deposit into that address but only i have my key to unlock that and where you're storing your keys okay so um mark was just talking about uh storing okay uh so he compared it to a locker system where you have a public address where people can send money to you to that particular address and you have the private key which is your secret key that you use to unlock or lock and do transactions so this guy will um expound how the keys are created there's typically some secret phrase that you need to keep in a safe place which is what's used to create your secret key the way most people store this is in what's called a mnemonic phrase and you've probably seen this where it's either a 12 or a 24 word phrase typically and each of those words comes comes from a specific word list and when you stack those words together 24 words is the number most people use which corresponds about to the number of atoms in the known universe and so we're uh, storing a tremendous amount of randomness there that makes it computationally impossible to break into and that's the piece you need to keep safe okay that yeah so yeah i remember i mentioned about the the hackers will have difficulty hacking the system and this is also another reason why um it's very difficult for someone to have access to your account unless they have a copy of your secret phrase which is usually around 24 word it's like choosing which atom in the universe you are going to use to unlock this uh, storage okay where you store your bitcoin so atoms we're talking about the atoms one human body has seven octillion atoms 
So one human body has seven octillion atoms. That's seven followed by 27 zeros. So it's bottom line is like it's just impossible to uh, select which which words exactly which letters you're going to use to lock and un unlock the locker system okay so that's why it's very very difficult to uh, for someone to hack the system okay unless you give it to someone or so that's why it's it's very important to have to keep it to keep your um phrase word phrases with you carry it with you if you have if you're using the cold storage that was a lot to throw at you so let's try to keep simplifying it bitcoin might seem complicated uh, at the same time i'd argue it's way less complicated actually if you look underneath the hood to, to figure out how banks settle transactions and and but most of the people don't care right in traditional finance you hit the button it goes somewhere and it just ends up in my wallet and nobody asks how it got ultimately from point a to point b Bitcoin is new, and I get that people have more questions ultimately about it, but over time, I feel like the, the trust in kind of the Bitcoin blockchain, as well as the longevity of the technology and how, you know, the software has been up and running for so many years, people will stop asking the question. It'll become very normal. To sum this up, let's just hear a simple definition of Bitcoin. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a piece of software that allows two parties to exchange value over the internet in a transparent and trustless fashion, as easy as sending an email. So we're free to send Bitcoin through the internet as money without permission from any government or bank. But you might be wondering what the difference is between Bit. Okay, so that guy summarizes Bitcoin very well, very simple. So it's, um, it's a software. So the network, the Bitcoin network, is a software that allows you and me two parties to exchange values okay so it's a transfer over the internet it's like sending emails to one another okay but there are very important characteristics there so it's transparent because everyone can see and verify the network so it's very transparent this is very good for for example governments because at the moment we're having problems tracking where our money is spent okay so this will somehow minimize um, corruption in the government if the government will start adopting um, bitcoin it is trustless so there is a common phrase among bitcoiners that um, do not trust verify do not trust verify so trustless we don't have to trust each other it's the network who will verify the transaction anyway so you don't i don't have to trust you you don't have to trust me it's the network who will verify the transaction and it's permissionless we don't have to ask the bank to uh, you know check and or, or allow us to withdraw money okay so it's permissionless we have full control over our assets over our bitcoin okay so that's a very good um, quick summary now i think they will be talking about cbdc's um let's just have a look coin and the cbdc's you've been hearing about what a CBDC is, is central bank digital currency. Now, what it is, is they're trying to take, and when I say they, I mean central banks and the government are trying to take the concept of fiat currency and digitize it into a digital dollar. Now, the challenge with this is that allowing the state to create these central bank digital currencies, it is creating a mechanism by which the government can surveil every single transaction that an individual makes. And not only can they surveil these transactions, it allows them to turn off your bank account if you start doing something that they disagree with. This is an extremely slippery slope 
that if we allow the government to go down this path, it has the potential to enslave humanity in the long term. And I think it's something that we need to carefully review because if we go down a CBDC path, allowing the government this level of control, it's unprecedented, which is why we should avoid this at all cost and stick to a hard money standard like Bitcoin. The central bank literally would be in position to cancel any transaction. It would be permissioned, not permissionless. And it's one thing you know, for MasterCard, for example, to know how much they paid to Walmart last year, but it's another thing for them to tell the world how much you paid at Walmart last year. And it's a whole different level of creepy for them to say exactly what did you buy at Walmart last year. And I think people kind of broadly get that sense of privacy. That's what's at stake here. I think the future of money really is one of the most important policy debates we're having today. And when you think about where, where people could go, with a, a kind of an Orwellian surveillance state money system like a central bank digital currency. It really is a good versus evil, and, and Bitcoin in this case is on the good. The countries that are clinging to a CBDC are trying to control their people, and those are weak governments. Weak leaders are the ones who try to control everybody. The strongest leaders are the ones who trust people and set them free. The problem I have with CBDCs is they're Marxist. And what I mean, the central bank. Marxism is central banking system. So that's why I support Bitcoin, because Bitcoin, I saw the strength coming from the people, not the government. I think the CBDCs, wherever they are, are a threat to freedom. Absolutely. You're seeing CBDCs in China right now where the populace are trying to go into a store and they're scanning a QR code and they're seeing it in their wallet that it's an invalid purchase because maybe they're from a region that's 100 miles away or it's they're going to a pharmacy and they don't want that person to have access to that type of, of uh, drug or medical treatment. With the CBDC comes the programmability and control of the government saying, you're allowed to do this or you're not allowed to do that. And we've already seen it, it rolled out in China and it looks a little scary. So when you're doing that compare and contrast between a CBDC and Bitcoin, it's all about who's controlling the actual ledger. One's actually decentralized, the other one is not. It's completely controlled by the government. Now that you know the difference between... Okay. It's, it's just fiat currency digitalized. Okay, fiat currency digitalized. So why is this uh, scary? Because... Uh, it's becoming like a surveillance tool by the government. So they can monitor all, tra all transactions, they can freeze assets, they can tell you you cannot buy this, you cannot buy that, they can tell you you cannot buy here, only there. So there's a lot of um, uh, surveillance and control by the government, okay? So um, as they explained, this is a kind of like a threat to freedom. It's very undemocratic. It's very uh, un-American. Okay, um, it's it's a kind of a modern day enslavement. Okay, so it's against the democratic principles. Okay, it is not permissionless. It's permissioned. You have to ask the government, uh, the central bank, to allow you to access your own asset. So it's permission and as what uh, Robert Kiyosaki said uh, it's it's kind of like Marxism when there is central con centralized control so it's like central banking okay um, unlike BTC the Bitcoin is decentralized so people are the ones banking and safe keeping their own assets they are threatened by bitcoin the central banks and i should say perhaps the central banks will also become obsolete <laughs> okay so all these federal reserves the banks uh the central banks unless they will join the bitcoin revolution they will become obsolete uh, in my opinion now that you know the difference between Bitcoin and a CBDC, let's play a little game. Hey everyone, time for one of my favorite games, CBDC versus Bitcoin. 
Here's how we play. I'll read you a headline from our not-so-distant future, and you have to decide, am I describing a CBDC or Bitcoin? Are you ready? Okay, first one. After criticizing President Macron on social media, French Pilot's digital wallet is frozen. Come on, this one's a no-brainer. CBDC or Bitcoin? That's right, CBDC. Next. British electrician protests being denied a pint of lager at local pub for exceeding his alcohol limit for the week. Which is it? CBDC, Bitcoin. Well, of course it's a CBDC. All right, last one. Are you ready? Can I get a drum roll, please? After Chinese invasion, Taiwanese citizens escape with their savings in their head. Border guards are unable to confiscate their wealth. You tell me, CBDC or Bitcoin? That's right, Bitcoin for the win. Thanks for joining us today, folks. Natalie, back to you. Okay, that's a fun, that's a fun game. We have already heard stories about how Bitcoin enables refugees to get, get out of uh, war-torn countries and save their lives and begin a new life somewhere else only because they have btc they have bitcoin so the only thing that they need is a passport a few luggage and your secret keys okay or maybe your ledger or something like that treasure or ledger uh and and that's it you can move your assets from one country to another can you do that with other properties? No, it's going to be hard to transport your house, your car, whatever it is, okay? I sold my house, crazy me, um, sold my house and converted that into Bitcoin because I know that Bitcoin is also an asset. It's a, it's a digital asset. So, and, and I was thinking, my house will probably grow in value but not as fast as my bitcoin so i was thinking yeah um, i think i'm better off selling my house and buy bitcoin okay so um yeah that's one thing you can do when you have to move from a war torn area to another area so that's one thing you can do, do. You convert all your assets, you sell all your assets, and buy Bitcoin and move somewhere else. So, see? So, BTC is a store of value. So, we're talking now about Bitcoin as a store of value. So, basically, Bitcoin has two uses. As a currency, as a global currency, as a medium of exchange, and also as a, as an asset okay as a store of value a digital asset hopefully by now you're feeling more assured so let's get back to the idea that bitcoin fixes everything and look at exactly what it can fix i think that there's a moral case we made for bitcoin in that it is for the end consumer for the citizen it is the stable form that cannot be stolen or corrupted or manipulated or inflated. And so for an individual, that is a great thing. It doesn't necessarily benefit certain governments who want the ability to wipe out with the stroke of a pen or the muzzle of a gun the bank accounts of its citizens. So politicians promise you that they will make your houses more valuable, that you can use them as ATM and extract value from them, that you'd have cheap borrowing and cheap leased cars and cheap mobile phones, and you'll just be wasteful and keep consuming, borrowing, spending, consuming. This is not sustainable. It's not sustainable for human harmony. It's not sustainable for the planet. It leads to a joyless market society that measures GDP and exchange value over experiential value. And experiential value is much more valuable to human beings. We don't measure our literacy rates, our suicide rates, our divorce rates, our happiness, our pollution within the GDP metric. We only measure exchange value. So as long as people, politicians keep saying, oh, GDP is going up, therefore we're all doing great. That's a massive problem for human society and it's not sustainable for our planet. So I think it's extremely important that we consider a sound form of money 
as a fundamental change for our financial and monetary system, because that will put us back on an even keel. How does all this get us back to the Brady Bunch days? You know, where a family can actually live off one income and have a balanced life? Bitcoin can make life affordable again and allow us to plan for our future. If money actually held its value, imagine the freedom we would have. I think store value is a really interesting concept that uh, ultimately people are trying to figure out where can I put my economic value that I've gotten in exchange for the work that I've done. And I don't just want it to not go away. Maybe actually it should increase in value over time. And I think something like Bitcoin uh, continues to perform over the last 15 years as the best store of value on the planet. People view Fed monetary easing as printing money. And if you're printing money, it's going to create inflation and therefore sound money tends to grow in value. Just in case you haven't heard of sound money, let's take a moment to learn what that term really means. What is sound money? The term sound money originated back when we used gold coins as currency. Oftentimes, as a way to create more money, kings and queens would mix in common, cheaper metals with gold. That way, they could create a coin that looked like it was pure gold, but really, it was diluted. And that allowed them to create more coins with the same amount of gold. So instead of 10 ounces of gold being able to create 10 coins, now they could use that 10 ounces of gold mixed with junk metals and create 14 coins. It was a very sneaky theft of the people's money. The public got wise to this scam and found a simple but clever way to test if their coins were pure. If they dropped them, a pure gold coin would make a different sound than a diluted one. Today, when we refer to sound money, we mean money that cannot be diluted. Bitcoin is the soundest form of money humans have ever created because no matter how hard anyone tries, you can't dilute Bitcoin by creating more of it. There will only ever be 21 million for all of human history. So because Bitcoin can't be printed out of thin air, it gives us money we can trust. And what's more, it's inclusive and open to everyone around the world. Okay, so I'll just comment on that. Um, so as um, Pomp was saying, uh, as a store of value, you need money that hold its value over time. If you cannot have a, mo a monetary system that changes according to the whims of our governments. So you need something that is, um, um, that holds its value and even perhaps increase its value over time so that we can plan for our future. So when we can predict uh, how much we earn and how how much is the purchasing power of, of the money that we earn. So we can somehow plan for our future, plan how many children we can have, plan for um, education, plan for retirement, plan for holidays and on all, all sorts of things. So, so you, it needs to be a sound money, a money that cannot be diluted. It is pure. There is nothing in it in its in the olden days when they have silver. So over time they diluted it with mix it with something else. But no, it has to be pure. It cannot be impure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and the supply needs to be fixed. It 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 can only be twenty one million, no more, no less. Otherwise you will have val the, the purchasing power, the value of that money changing all the time if you don't have uh, a fixed supply and some kind of predictability, okay? So now this is the last topic and it for this part, part three, um, they will be talking about financial inclusion, which is another, another issue. You know, if you are one of the 50% of the planet who does not have a bank account, you are shut off from the global economy. You can't go shopping on the internet if you don't have access to a credit card or some form of digital payment. So there's a huge amount of people around the world that are 
frozen out of the financial system and the ability to improve their life circumstances. Bitcoin it is designed ultimately to replace both the monetary system and the financial system. It is a math-based system where at its core, it is trying to remove politics from money. The beautiful part about that is that anyone anywhere in the world can use Bitcoin at any time for any reason. No one can censor them, no one can stop them. Uh, no one can tell them that their use of money is um, wrong or not allowed. No one is going to change the rules on them halfway through and everyone operates by the same rules. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire, it doesn't matter if you're a president, it doesn't matter who you are. You have the exact same rights within the Bitcoin system that the person who makes $1 a day has. Do I, I believe that it can help people rise up out of poverty and give them opportunity to do business where they weren't able to before? Yes, I do. And it's certainly been the case around the world where people have had gotten access to a financial system that they didn't have access to before. For example, talk about financial inclusion, for instance. The current um, financial system excludes a large amount of people from being able to access financial services. If you looked at uh a continent like Africa, one of the reasons they can't crawl out of poverty is because the currencies in every country in Africa, are, they're either broken completely, completely defective, or they're impaired, and they're continually siphoning economic energy from the working class and from the businesses in those economies into the hands of the politicians that control the corrupt currencies. You, in essence, don't really have any hope of accumulating wealth if you're paid in a defective currency and the currency is continually collapsing. Not only does Bitcoin allow people to be their own bank, it is the only form of money that gives us digital property rights. Okay, so we'll just end there. And I just would like to add to that discussion that around, yeah, as they say, around 50% of the world's population are still and bank. So they're not included in the financial systems, okay? There are still people who transact in cash, okay? Um, so Bitcoin allows us to, to participate in the network, to participate in the financial system the global financial system. All you need is a phone, access to the internet, and then you can join the network and be on the same level field as anyone else in the world. No matter um, your financial status, no matter how much income you have. Okay, so it doesn't really matter. If you have access to the network, can open a, an account, then you're in. And we're all equal in that sense, okay? So I will stop here, because otherwise there are still a lot of things to digest in there, and um, yeah. We will continue with the discussion on part four of my reaction to God bless bitcoin documentary see you on the next video bye for now